God, we just come before you this morning and we humble ourselves and we say thank you that God, when, when we come before you, that you are very present just as you are right now. And so God, we ask that Lord, you would fill this place. And just as Jen spoke earlier, God, that whatever need is present this morning, Whatever need, that knee needs to bow in the presence of the mighty name of Jesus. And we declare your blood over every situation that seems hopeless, that seems dead. We declare your mercy, Lord, over situations that seem there's, seems there's no fix. God, I declare your spirit to fill your people, your sons, your daughters this morning by the power of your word that is faithful, that Lord, when we declare it, we can say amen because you never turn from your promises. God, we welcome you this morning and we say thank you, Lord. We love you. We bless your name and all God's people said amen, amen. Have y'all give it up for Malachi real quick? Thank you, man. Ushering in the presence of God. And uh, wow, so good to see you this morning. And uh, if we haven't met, my name is Bryce. I'm one of the co-pastors here at Harbor Church. And if you're online joining us this morning, we want to say thank you uh, for just putting aside intentional time to be with the Lord, to praise the Lord, and to hear from Him today. And I just believe because of that effort, that, that faith is the currency of the kingdom. And when you move in faith and belief, God answers you. And so whatever it is that you need this morning, I just believe that God is going to answer that. We are in, I don't even know how many weeks this thing is right now, but we are in set your sails and we have been sailing like crazy. And uh, we've been going for it. I believe this is week four of set your sails. And uh, God has just been doing such an incredible thing over these last few weeks. And we kicked it off with the gospel being the wind in our sails knowing that it's not in our own effort, but it's in the wind of the gospel, the power of the gospel. The second week, we were talking about uh, positioning ourselves. So you hear the greatest news the earth has ever known, and then what do you do now with that? And it's when we position ourselves and posture ourselves that we see us being led by the Spirit and not by whatever the world wants us to follow. And then last week, I heard you guys were sailing with Jesus while I was out. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really pumped about, about this word and, and what God is going to share. Um, it's really funny when you're preparing for a sermon, just how everyday ordinary things in life just somehow just get spiritualized and they all go back to God in some way, shape or form. You know what I'm talking about? Like you can be doing just the normal, most normal thing ever, driving in your car, ordering something from Bojangles, going to get groceries. Um, I don't know why I'm talking about food so much. Probably I'm hungry. Um, but but this, whole, this whole series, uh, there's been so many applications to this and it almost sounds too good to be true. And that's because it is that good. It is that good. You know, that grace that we just get to receive, that wind that God so graciously continues to just blow in our direction that is meant for his glory and then for our good. And we can trust in that. But this whole series has basically, if, if I could give it a, a one sentence premise would be this. We are moving with or without the spirit of God. That's what this whole series is about. I'm either moving with the Spirit of God, or I'm not moving with the Spirit of God. And the hope is, is at the end of this, is that you see yourself working less for something that God has already provided in His Son, Jesus. That is the hope. And so if I had to give the message this morning a title, it would be this, the mutter, the utter, and the rudder. And yes, I had to look up all three of those, okay? <laughs> the mutter, the utter, and the rudder. How many of you know that this world is absolutely filled with information, excuse me, let me back up, false information, opinions, distractions, temptations? I'm telling you something you already know. 
It is filled with these things. And I don't know why I did it, but I, even before church, jumped on social media and I swear to you, I literally started to, to perspire. Like I literally started to sweat because of the anxiety that started to come over me just looking on social media. But it is filled with these things. And, and, and there's fear all over, all over the world right now. And fear can drive people to do some crazy things. Some absolutely crazy things. But we're conditioned to just simply accept all of these things. Like, we'll, we'll just like, we'll see something on the internet. Oh, yeah, that's so true. I'm going to share that. Yep, that's got to be true. You know, because there's a, there's a, a footnote. And yep, that's totally credible. But I'm going to go with that. And, and then before we know it, we start to believe these headlines in our lives. And before we know it, they begin to subtly dictate the direction of our life. But even in a world filled with fear, I love what the Word of God says in 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us, you. And anytime I'm saying us, I want you to say me. In your mind, I mean, you can say it out loud if you want to. It's great. Talk, talk back is good. It always makes the preacher preach harder. But I want you to say me because this is a word for you. Like God is speaking to you right now. But this is what it says, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God's not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power and love and self-discipline. But here's the crazy thing is that fear is a reality. You can probably think of a moment at least one this week, that you were afraid. Maybe you were anxious. Maybe you were overwhelmed. Maybe you just didn't see how things were going to come together. I mean, I had a friend the other day literally call me up on the phone. Hey, man, did you see, did you see all those supplies stranded out at sea? You better go get your toilet paper now. A few months now, you ain't going to have toilet paper. You're going to be using leaves. And I'm sitting there like freaking out. And I had to what? I had to stop in that moment and go, wait a second. God has not once not taken care of me up until this point. So why, now that I hear this news, do I think that that's going to change? We're singing a song about your faithfulness is my confidence, not me. But I started to think about me. I'm not going to have toilet paper. I'm not going to have paper towels. I'm not going to have the bare necessities. But I had to stop in that moment and, and remember what spirit is guiding my sails today. And I can choose which one I allow. See, fear, fear is the reality. And, and if you say, you know, you're not afraid, I would say you're a liar. But here's the thing about it is that even when you're afraid, you can choose to have courage or you can choose to bow to the fear. I love what God said to Joshua. Joshua was a mighty warrior in the Old Testament. And, and Joshua was afraid. And I love what God said to him. He said, Joshua, be strong and courageous. He didn't say, here is my courage. Here is my strength. Joseph already, or, uh, Joshua already had it inside of him. God was recalling what was already in his possession, the courage of the Lord. It's in us. It's in us. But you know the first instance of fear ever in, in the world's creation, the first ever instance of fear. And this baffled me. I had to go back to the very beginning of the Bible. But, but this really baffled me because it's the last person you would think to be afraid of. The last person on planet Earth. Genesis 3.8. Let's read this. When the cool evening breezes... And again, the Bible's funny. I don't know why the Bible saw fit to put when the cool evening breezes. But I just think, hey, it's a nice fall day like today. And we're just hanging out. You're in here in church. You're seeing your friends. You're seeing your family. When the cool evening breezes were blowing. I don't know if there's any theological significance to that. The man and his wife, talking about Adam and Eve, heard the Lord walking in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to man as if God, completely omnipotent and omnipresent, didn't know where the heck these fools were, says, where are you? And this is, this is the response. This is the response of Adam. 
I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Isn't that crazy? The very first instance of fear in the Bible, they were afraid of God. Who gave them a garden, said be fruitful and multiply. I got fruit to take care of that. I got vegetables to take care of that. This is yours. I want you to tend to it. I want you to enjoy it with me. And Adam and Eve find themselves afraid, the first instance of fear, of God. That was crazy to me. He's been nothing but good and faithful and generous to them. And Adam and Eve are afraid. But you know what happened right before that when they ran into God? The enemy came to Eve and asked her a question. Did God really say, don't eat that? And then she started to think about it. She was deceived and then began, said, Adam, take this and eat it. The enemy will always overpromise and underdeliver. Always. And isn't it crazy that what started in a promise of power, because that's what the enemy wanted to do. Hey, be like God. If you do this, did God really say you're going to die? You're not going to die. Matter of fact, if you go and eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're going to be like God. God. Why would God hold that from you? And so what is the enemy doing? He's distorting the image of God to Adam and Eve in that moment. And the enemy said, here, I want to pro- I'm going to promise you power. The enemy can't promise you nothing. Nothing. Only God can do that. But it blew my mind that the enemy would promise them power. But what did it result in? I'm going to fall stage. What did it result in? I'm getting so excited. It resulted in panic. What started in power ended in absolute panic. And they hid. They hid exactly where the enemy is. Slithering like a serpent on the ground. And they're hiding in the dark. Afraid. They're afraid of the one who gave them everything. Everything. Absolutely everything. And so this is where I want to this is where I want to talk about. Do you remember the first word I said? Alan, you remember it? Okay, I'll remind you. The mutter. The mutter. The mutter. The mutter. I had to look this up and I promise you I have a definition for it. This is what mutter means. To utter words indistinctly or in a low tone. Often as if speaking to oneself. Do you talk to yourself ever? Yeah. Do you mutter to yourself? See, I see Alan in downtown all the time. Alan's just saying, uh, either you're talking to yourself or you're talking to Jesus. Yeah, talking to Jesus. That's exactly right. But there is, whether you're talking to yourself out loud or whether it's the conversation or the dialogue that takes place within your mind, we all talk to ourselves. And and Eve began to talk to herself, too. She's thinking in her mind, why would God withhold that from me? Why would he keep that from me? And it all started with a question. She begins to question the very one that created the place to begin with. She's like, man, really? What's going to happen? I do kind of want to know. And this is what I want you to see in Scripture is that to be loved and to be known is is greater than understanding. To be loved and to be known is greater than the understanding. Adam and Eve didn't understand it all, but their desire to want to know every detail then created and allowed an open door for sin and curse to enter the world. And so she's talking to herself. She's in the dark, hiding amongst the trees, doesn't want to see God, trying to run from him. They tie up fig leaves because they see that they're naked. They're ashamed. They're naked and afraid. Y'all ever seen that show? They are definitely not ashamed. I'm going to tell you that right now. They are just naked and living their life. <laughs> but the internal dialogue takes place. And maybe, maybe this is some of the dialogue that takes place in your mind. I don't have what it takes. I've said that before. She always gets recognition. And I'm over here working my butt off. 
God can't ever use me because I can't overcome this addiction. Okay, well, I'll just settle for life as it is right now. If it was going to happen, it happened by now. It's internal dialogue. It's the scarcity mindset that we live in. It's, it's the one that goes, hmm, there's no, really, there's no real hope for this anymore. Maybe that's, maybe that's just, the, maybe that's just the, God's capacity. Maybe that's all he's got for me. Maybe that's it. And I just need to, I just need to hold on tight and wait till I get to the pearly gates. That's what I'll do. But have you ever taken the time? Because again, the spirit that is given to us by God is not one of fear, but it's one of love. It's one of power and self-discipline. Discipline. Have you ever had the discipline of tracing that mutter? Because you'll hear the mutter and we'll be just, oh yeah, that's the truth. Oop, saw that post. Yep, that's exactly how the world is and it's just, Oh, it's going straight to hell in a handbasket. I'm just going to accept it. Or do you take the time and have the self-discipline to go, you know what? I'm going to figure out where this came from. I'm going to figure out where this came from. Did this come from my creator or is this some serpent just trying to deceive me and trick me and overpromise something that he will constantly underdeliver? Do you trace that mutter? What is the origin and where did it start? Here's a prime example. The first instance, Jesus is calling his disciples and he gets out on this boat with a man named Simon Peter. And what is the response of Simon Peter? The moment that this boat gets so full with fish, they had to call the other fish fishermen in because the nets were breaking and they hadn't caught fish all day long. What does Simon Peter say? Get away from me. I am a sinful man. I'm a sinful man. Why is that the first response of Simon Peter in that moment? Because that's how he saw himself. That that thought in his head at some point began to take root and now became his identity. And you know what Jesus does? He is in the business of redeeming. And taking what the enemy meant for evil and turning it for good. And Jesus literally has the audacity to go, Simon Peter, your name is Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. I'm a sinful man. The church is going to be built on me. What? That, I, look at the contrast there. Jesus steps into the scene to redeem what the enemy had created in Peter's life. And he's doing that in your life too. Because there are thoughts and there are origins and, and traces of these mutters in your mind that are not of God, but this slithery snake stepped in and tried to convince you. Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? And you begin questioning yourself. The enemy is relentless and wants you to live in fear every day of your life. Why? Because fear halts you. Fear stops you. The word of God never stops. It is alive and is active. But the enemy wants us to stop. And so how do I patiently endure? How do I patiently wait when everything feels like a loss? You're just like, man, life is not just not going according to my plan. This is not happening like I, how I thought it would. What do you do when everything feels like a loss? You worship. You worship. It's no secret formula. It's just I worship. I get to worship. And I believe in this day and age, this is one of the most underutilized weapons we have as believers is the ability and the privilege to worship. Why? Not only am I bringing praise to God because he's worth it. Yes, he's worthy. And that is, that is true. But also, I get to remind myself of the truth. And when I worship, it's just like a gardener coming in and just uprooting lies, uprooting your mistakes, uprooting how you've seen yourself for the last 37 years, just cleaning house and going, nope, 
This is how your creator intended it from the very beginning. And this is how he wants you to see yourself through his son, Jesus. When God looks at you, he does not see you in your mess. He sees you in Jesus. He sees his son, Jesus. That's amazing. And here's the best part about it. Is when you worship God, you are creating, yeah, I'll say it, a dance floor. Just to be cheesy, you're creating this dance floor, this open space. And guess what? It says in Psalm that God inhabits the praises of his people. As you're worshiping this morning, we're singing, all your promises are yes and amen. Boom. Presence of God inhabits the praises. He inhabits those praises. And when the presence of God is in the picture, the enemy can't be there anymore. God, when, when the devil deceived Adam and Eve, he then said, you are cursed and you are going to you're going to slither on your belly for the rest of your life. And then guess what's going to happen? He goes ahead and prophesies. My son is going to come and he's going to crush your head with his heel. And it's going to be done. That's great news. That's great news. That the lies and the deceit and, 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 and the confusion that the enemy tried to bring in your life through one man named Jesus is crushed forever. He didn't have to strangle him. He didn't have to punch him. He just took his foot and went, boom, just like that. That's what, that's what Jesus did. We get to worship. We get to declare God's truth, which brings me into the second word. You remember the second word? It was mutter, and then it's not the thing you milk cows with, but U-T-T-E-R, the utter. Maybe that's, how, maybe that's the same spelling. I don't know. <laughs> But we get to utter. So a mutter is the, I I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can make it. I don't have what it takes. This is not going to go well. I better just hold on tight. The utter is the vocal expression and statement of assurance. That's what an utter is. In the same way, that God uttered the earth into existence. It was, an, it was an affirmative action of the vocal cords. That's what it is. In the same way that you have a conversation with somebody. The same way that I'm talking right now. It's an utterance. And you know what's crazy? is like so much of the stuff. Like an, utter, an utterance is like this is what it is. This is what it is. The sky is blue. I'm sitting in a chair. I'm standing on a stage. What's crazy is that the earth comes with a, but there's more. You know what I mean? Like the, like the enemy. He's like, hey, you're going to get power and doesn't even tell them, are you really going to die? Yeah, but you don't know. You're going to be, you're going to be living under a curse and sin, enter, sin has, has entered the world and you're going to need a redeemer named Jesus to come and save you. The devil didn't say all that, right? Why? Because he under delivered. Because all he does is lie and steal what God has given you. But there's more. It's like those commercials. But there's more. When you call right now, we'll add two more back scratchers. The price of one. What? That's crazy. And then we fall for it. And then we got three back scratchers we never use. This is awesome. But that's how it is. I was um, <laughs> I was walking in the mall like a year ago. And I know y'all, I know y'all have seen this before. But I don't know why I fell for it, but I did. I was, I was weak, y'all. I was just weak. I was in a weak place. I wasn't prayed up. And, and I'm walking in this mall, and I see this clear podium-looking thing with a box. And then I see the Bahamas, just this picture of the Bahamas. And it said, it said free getaway. And I was like, dude. And it was, it was a giveaway. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. This is awesome. Free I might as well. Like, I'll just say, I ain't, ain't going to win, but I'll just throw it. See what I mean? The enemy was lying to me then. You ain't going to win. But I, but, I, but I signed the little pink slip. I signed this little pink slip with my name, put my phone number. I didn't put my email, though, because like, I, I don't want none of this. I'm about to unsubscribe. But I put my phone number in there. Free five-day getaway to the Bahamas. Free. Sweet. Two days later, I get a phone call. And, no, and normally, I don't, I, don't take, I don't take, you know, random phone calls from people because... That junk's just gotten off. That's just gotten crazy. I'll block them. But I answered the phone. She goes, hey, is this Bryce? Yeah. What's up? Hey, this is Nicole with the blah, 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 Bahama getaway. You won. 
<laughs> I'm like, what? No way. Like, that's so cool. Sweet. So like, she's like, yeah, no, we just need to book your date. Find out when you're free, and you get to bring somebody along with you. I'm like, sweet. So I'm not going by myself. I get to bring a friend. This is awesome. And uh, and and so we like we set up the date. Uh, you know, I'm thinking who I'm going to bring. And then she goes, okay. Now we got to set up your airfare. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, awesome. That in the package? Mm 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 no. Um, and, and 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 I'm telling you, she goes out. We gotta take care of your airfare and we gotta take care of your food. Y'all, I tell you, when I signed up on this little pink slip, the only thing that was free was my bedroom for five nights and everything else I had to pay for. And by the end of it, it was as much as going on a regular, you know, Bahamas five day getaway if you paid for it yourself. It was insane. Just trying to upsell me on all this stuff. But that, but that is, that is how the world works. There's always this catch. There's all, there's always this thing that it's like, it can't just be yes. Like, don't you love people who just let their yes be yes? Like, hey, man, can you come help me uh, move? <laughs> Which is like, <laughs> you know, if you're, hey, man, can you help me move? I'm moving. Dad, I'm not talking about you. I'm thinking about something else. <laughs> but can you come help me move? And like, deep down, you're like, God, really? I mean, I'd sure love to sit on my couch on Saturday morning, but yeah. But you know when people say yes and you know they're going to be there? It just gives you like, just happiness. And then there's some people, you know, you're like, yeah. Maybe. Anyway, really? And that's how I felt that day. I'm like, why can't this just be a free vacation? There has to be all these other things that are attached to this. And it and it and it, it kind of upset me. I was like, Nicole, you seem like a nice person, but I gotta go. See ya. And I hung up the phone. But I want you I want to read something out of 2 Corinthians, and we were singing about this earlier, but 2 Corinthians 1 19 through 20 says this For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Sylvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always that's your cue. In him it is always in him it is always. For all the promises, all of them, not 90% of them, not just your room, but the airfare and the fridge drinks and the snacks and the free gym membership, all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter. That is why we utter our amen to God's glory. I'm not muttering something that I half believe in. I utter with my vocal cords, amen to God for the promises that are true and trustworthy through the son, Jesus. Amen is a precious word. Amen is a precious word. And you know, I, that's always my closing. You know what I'm saying? In the name of Jesus, amen. And it's kind of like, amen. It's like, mm. It's always going, amen. What if we looked at the amen as, I believe you, God. Like when I say amen, I didn't just pray something and then through amen to put a period on the end of my prayer. No, but amen meant I am in agreement with everything that you've promised me, God. Everything that you promised Amen. Let it be. That's what amen means. And I think there is a misconception too because we that's the closing of a prayer. That's just tradition. That's what we do. But the truth, the truth of the matter is, is that amen doesn't primarily mean, yes, I have said all this in prayer. Because that's normally how it is. Like, yep, amen, I've said all this. I'm going to close it up, put the button on. What amen means is yes, God, you have made all these promises. Yes, God, you've made all these promises. Amen means, yes, Lord, you can do it. It means, yes, Lord, you are powerful. Yes, Lord, you are wise. Yes, Lord, you are merciful. Amen is the exclamation point of faith in your prayer. It is the affirmation of God's greatness. It is the affirmation of his greatness. 
And here's the deal, though, is that we can either roll with the Spirit of God or not. As like I said at the beginning, is we can either choose to roll with the Spirit of God and allow His wind to direct our lives as we're all on our little sailboats in the ocean they're called life, enjoying. Because you do, you do understand that God's intention by sending His Son was to recalibrate and reset life as it was meant to be in the garden. That was his intention. Why? Because he looked at the earth and he said, that is good. That is good. He doesn't make mistakes. And the job of him sending his son is so that we can experience a garden life in a sinful and a fallen world. A garden life is one that flourishes. A garden life is one that 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 is alive. A garden life is one that you can partake of and enjoy the fruits of your labor and the fruits of the riches of the glory of Christ. That's the garden life that we get to experience. All right, I'm going to round this thing out here. So we talked about the mutter. We talked about the utter. Now, the last one, the rudder. The rudder. I had to look this one up too. Okay. I should have just asked Squires if Abbott Tunstall is here. The rudder is simply the turning piece on a boat. It's kind of fascinating, honestly. If you think about it, the majority, I mean, 98 to 99% of the mass of a boat is like the hull and am I getting this right, Mike? Is the hull, you know, even your motor, all this stuff. But this rudder is this just this one, one piece, just like this, like this just rectangle. And when you turn it, it pierces the water and causes you to go in a different direction. There's like a rudder at the, at the, at the bottom. You've got the propeller on the motor. I should have put a picture of a motor. And then there's a rudder at the bottom of it. And it pierces this water and it causes you to go in different directions. Kind of like in the same manner that, that when you begin to utter certain things. And I love this about speaking. I love this about, and I'm not talking about like this speaking. I'm talking about just opening your mouth. Like get, it, like get out of your head and opening your mouth because your, ear, your ears hear what you're saying. And you begin to tell yourself a new story. That's so beautiful. And, then, and it, what does it do? It begins to change the direction of, of your life. That's why it's so important that when, you're, when, when you, uh, you make time to come and, and worship God and sing songs. I mean, it, it, moments when your faith is weak and you're like, I cannot, I cannot do this. Great. You don't have to come up with anything fancy. You can literally hit your knees and start worshiping God. You don't even need a song. You don't even need music. You can worship Him whenever and wherever. It doesn't have to look like a song. It can look like it can look like a, a podcast. Just a, just word. Like I'm just turning on. Like normally I'm listening. You know, like you're listening. You can listen to the bridge, but you can also listen to a podcast. Listen to a preacher preach the Word of God. Just open up the Bible. There's no manual for like, hey, you need to start here. No. God just gave us this and said, hey, have fun. Getting to know me and knowing your true self. Talking about God with somebody in your life. I don't think you can. That's where I feel closest to the Lord. If I'm having a conversation with somebody and they're showing me, man, you have no idea. This is what God did in my life. And I, I really, I really didn't see how it was going to happen. And man, we just stopped and we prayed and we asked God to come in and then we just worshiped and he, and he, and he inhabited the praises of, of, of us because we're, we're his people, we're his sons and his daughter. And before I knew it, he changed my whole focus and, and nothing changed. But you know what I got? I got peace. That stuff encourages me. Just having a conversation about God with somebody. But what's the significance of this? How does a mutter and an udder and a rudder connect? Because every single one of you have a rudder. You got it locked up right now because you're using these. Right there. Right there. 
That's your, that's your rudder. That's the direction. That's what changes the direction of your life. And this is what James 3, 4 says. A small rudder. To some of you, you're like, yeah, but God didn't call me to be a preacher. God, God called me to just be a mother. God just, I mean, to, I'm called to be a nurse. God called me to do this. God called me to do that. Sure. But God has called you in whatever sphere you find yourself in or position or hat that you have on that moment to carry the presence of God into that place. And you have a rudder. You have a spirit inside of you that is not one of fear, but it is one of power and love and of self-discipline. This is what James 3, 4 said. A small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever, get this, wherever the pilot, not God, wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. You know what that means? No matter how strong something comes against you, nothing can withstand the power of the rudder. Nothing can withstand the power of the rudder. But the game changer is, does the pilot choose to use it or not? I can flow with him. I cannot flow with him. We can choose. I can go with you, God, and I can steer my rudder in your direction, and I can declare your words that I read in your scripture and that I worship in a song, or I can choose not to, no matter how strong the winds are. This is what I want you to know. Scripture is a divine utterance. That does just make you, just give you strength. Scripture is a divine utterance. That means everything written in this word is not one spoken out in fear. Like you're hiding in the darkness like Adam and Eve were. But no, this word of God is a divine utterance that when it went out, what is no is no and what is yes is yes. And every single promise in the word of God, I can stand firmly and go, yes. That's the confidence that I have because his word is this divine utterance. How can you say that? Because the word of God says so. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and it's powerful. And, and God's just flexing right here. He says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And what's the, what's the, what are the swords? Because I'm always thinking, what do you mean when you say that the word of God is is a sword. I don't I don't quite know how to understand that, but if it's sharper than any two-edged sword, you've got you have got distractions and temptations and and fears and fallacies and opinions that are flying at you. And 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 here's the here's the deal. You're either getting chopped up where it's hurting you or you're getting pruned up where it is helping you. And that's what the Word of God does. The world is trying to continue to tear you down, tear you down, tear you down. The enemy, what did he do? He looked at them and he said, did God really say that? And they thought they were going to be like God. And they weren't. They had everything they needed and more in the garden. And the enemy came in and with his sword, cut them. Now they're walking naked and afraid. But the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Let's keep reading it. What does it mean by that? It cuts between the soul and the spirit. Between joint and marrow. It exposes the innermost thoughts and desires. Your heart is deceptive. Your heart is deceptive. Remember that song? Listen to your heart when he's calling for you. Listen to your heart. I used to like that song. I don't like it anymore. I don't. I really don't. Mm -mm. It's a classic, but I hate it. Because it's a lie. It is a lie. 
<laughs> if it's not coming from here, then my heart is going to mislead me every single time. Yeah. I need this. I need this. Why? Because Adam and Eve couldn't even do it in the garden with God. How do I expect in this world to live victoriously, do the thing God's called me to do without this? I can't do it. I need, I need this work, this word to go to work on my behalf. I need it to get down into the, the, the tiniest crevices that I don't show anybody because I'm too ashamed that they'll look at me differently. I need his word to get down in the dreams that I have. That maybe God put them there. Maybe it's a desire of your own. But I need the word of God to get in there then to direct me and show me which steps to take. Because he doesn't show me all the way down the end of the line. No, he said he's a, he has a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. He gives me just enough to take another step. Another step. And it follows me everywhere that I go. I need that sword to cut down. I mean, there's, there is not a, I mean, it's smaller than an atom what it means to cut between a soul and a spirit. We all have a spirit. That's what's going to go to heaven one day. We all have a soul. That's our mind, our will, and our emotions. And our mind and our will and our emotions just get us all wacky sometimes. You know what I'm saying? You know, uh, you, you're married and you, you get into a conversation with your beloved spouse. And, and before you know it, you just get a little angry. You just get... <clears throat> You just get a little frustrated. And, and, and what was first meant to be a cordial discussion in which we are going to find a solution in which to carry on about our day and go to the park and enjoy a walk together turns into a slugfest because now emotion has entered the scene. I need the word of God to come in the middle and go. Pfft. That's what I need. I need the word of God to come in and just. Pfft. And stop. I don't want to damage anymore. I don't want to join the enemy in damaging what God has so graciously given. I don't want to do it. I saw this verse and, and it, it honestly was one of the most powerful verses I think I've ever read in my life. But, but because here, because here's the thing is, is we're preaching the word and the truth of God's word, but in the same sense, there's reality that we experience as well. We experience the fear, we experience the frustration. And by no means am, am number one, am I condemning at all because we're human beings. Jesus wouldn't have had to die if we're not going to make mistakes every single day. Right? But he's also given us his word as a lamp into our feet and a light unto our path. When we feel like we're, we're in a dark place and we just don't know what to believe or where to go. But I love what Deuteronomy 8.3 says. Deuteronomy 8.3, if you could throw that up. I'm going to read this straight from the screen. Track with this. Track with this. I just, want you to, I just want you to listen to the heart of the Lord. Listen to the heart of the Lord. This is God. He, he humbled you. Calls it, bless you. Causing you to hunger. But I thought God satisfies all my needs. Why would he make me hungry? Then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had ever known. God is trying to bring you into something you have never known before, but he could not do it unless you were hungry. Because when you're hungry, you're desperate. And when you're desperate, you'll do crazy things. Why did he do this? To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. I 
I just believe that God is speaking to you very specifically right now. Like he's bringing to mind things in your life that fall within that passage of scripture right there. I believe the Holy Spirit is giving you remembrance of moments where you did not know why you were so hungry or why you were in a place of hunger. But then you look back and you went, my God in heaven, he is so good to me that he will cause me to hunger and forfeit what I thought I needed to give me something I have never known before. Then to teach me so I can walk this out all of my days, that it is not the bread that I ingest, but it is the very words from his mouth that direct my life. And you look back and you just go, wow. God doesn't hate you. God's not disappointed in you. God doesn't wish you'd do more. God isn't just sitting there like, better luck next year, you know? <laughs> Lost a jamboree, better luck next year, dude. That's not him. He's a good father who loves us so much. You know a good friend is one who will call out the very thing that is hindering you from being who God has called you to be? And it may hurt, feeling like a knife. Mm. But if it's of the word of God, it will only prune you. Not hurt you. They'll call, they'll call that thing out. Just as God disciplines us. Because he's good. He, he knows. And do you think God knew when he created the garden and everything in it that he would have to send his son one day? Yeah. He knew that. And guess what? He did it anyway. He created you and I anyway. Knowing we're going to take the rudder and... Peace out, God. Do my own thing. But yet, his word, yet his spirit that continues to beckon, it says in his word that he will draw all men unto himself by any means necessary. Looking out and seeing how the sun rises and it sets, seeing the testimony of a person delivered from bondage, seeing the last person you'd ever imagine in your high school come to know Christ and they ain't even the same person, that's God is drawing all men into himself by his word. And he gets to call us, his people, into a life where as the pilot, as the pilot, we get to determine. You know, I know God's sovereign, but we get to determine if we get to step into an alignment with that. And before before you go, I want to just declare these 10 things over you. And if you've got a pen, you got a paper or your phone, you want to pull up your notes app or whatever, I want to encourage you just to write it down because if 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 we leave out of here and we're saying, "Oh, y'all promises, are yes and amen." And we're like, "Wait, what are the promises?" Cuz I know some of y'all are thinking that, right? Well, what are the promises? That was my question. I'm studying and I'm like, "Wait, what a second. <laughs> what are the promises?" And yeah, I looked in Google, "What's what are the promises?" You know, in the scripture for everything. But I, I was like, God, I want to I want to know. Like, I want to know. Like, if, if, if I'm going to stand on this, I can say yes. I can say amen. I can say not that I'm putting a button on the end of this prayer, but amen. All your promises are true. You are all powerful. You are all merciful and you can do anything you want to. That's what I want. And so here are these promises. And there's a scripture to each of these. And I, I, I just... There is nothing more more powerful than this, than just letting the scriptures wash over you. It, it cleanses you. That's what the word does. I love that, that he calls us this sword. This sword first has to hit us before we go out and look at the dominions of darkness. Because yes, there is darkness all around this world and God has not called us to be passive, waiting for him to come back. But no, active in stepping out into this world and being a light and a sword. With this, because we are in a war that God has called us to, but we are already victorious through Christ. And so here, here are the 10 promises of God. He will never leave you alone. And I'm just going to read them. He will never leave you alone. And I want to make sure you say, Joel, do we have this on the slide? He's a man. He will never leave you alone. Deuteronomy 31 eight. 
Here's the second one. He will give you rest when you're weary. And I want you to fill in the blank. He will give me rest. Own it. Why? Take it because it's yours. This is yours. I'm not just reading this on my fridge and it makes me, gives me some warm and fuzzies and then I take my coffee and walk out the door. No, this is mine I get to take. He'll give me rest when I'm weary. He redeems and saves you when you put your trust in Him. Four, He will give you strength when you're weak. He fights for you. Jesus is going to battle for you, man. Like he's like, you know what's crazy? Thank you, Jesus. Jesus came and did everything he was sent to the earth to do. And I love that scripture you said. How much, uh, what was that? Romans 8.38? 8.32. How much more will he not give you all things if he gave up his son? Jesus came and died a death he did not deserve. And what does he do? He doesn't go up. Yeah, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, but you know what he's doing? He's interceding for you. Like he's literally like crying out like to, to you. Like he's, 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 there's a spiritual battle going on and he is calling out your name, fighting for you, interceding, going to bat for your spirit. Where are we at? He fights for you? Yeah. He will never stop loving you. He gives wisdom to those who ask. He gives me wisdom when I ask. Three more. He has and will forever forgive you of your sins and purify you. You're in a process. It's called sanctification. He will purify you. Number nine. He has set you free by his son. And if the son has set you free... You free indeed. That's a promise. Number 10, the last one. Thank you, Jen, by the power of the Holy Spirit. You said this earlier. He meets all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. He meets all your needs. Not according to you. Not according to your effort. Not according to your willpower. Not according to how many times you got in the Bible this past week. Not according to you showing up to church on Sunday. Not according to you treating your boss kind even though you didn't want to. Not according to any of that. According to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. It all goes back to Christ. That's where it all goes back to. Because in the garden was Jesus right there. It says, in the beginning, the three were together, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, knowing that there would come a moment where Jesus would have to be sent at the perfect, most opportune time to redeem his children and call them and redeem them into the promised land. That is what Jesus did. He was there. And he sees you right now in the fears of that you're muttering in the times where you can muster up enough faith to just declare the word of God when you don't want to worship and you worship anyway. And guess what? He is there as the wind to your sails as you position this rudder and allow it to pierce through the waters and the worry and the fear and the anxiety of life to take you where you belong Right there at the feet of Jesus. He is just that good. And I want to pray. And in just a moment, we're going to take communion. And I, and I, and I want to pray uh, for, for those that are in a state of muttering. I want to pray for the ones that find themselves hiding amongst the trees. I want to pray for the ones that that feel naked and afraid. I want to pray for the ones that find themselves running from the very one that can give them the confidence and the courage that they truly need. And that's Father God. That's Abba Father. That's who I want to pray. 
And this is what I want you to declare because I just believe that there's going to be a breaking. I believe that there's going to be a breaking in your body that needs healing. I believe that there's going to be a breaking in your mind that has been on lockdown. I believe that there's going to be a breaking in the dreams that seem impossible. But guess what? You can declare the word of God and his presence is going to enter the scene. And with God, all things are possible. This is bigger This is bigger than the sign that was in your football locker room that gave you some warm and fuzzies before you went out and played the game. It's bigger than that. God wants to step right into your situation. He's asking, where are you? Where are you? Not to tell them like he told them in the garden. Hey, through this, the world has been cursed. No. He's saying, where are you? Because everything that you think you can't do happens through me. That's what he wants to tell you this morning. And he's beckoning you. He's calling you. And I want you to just, just believe. If you even have a mustard seed of faith, you can speak to that mountain. You say, move, and it will be tossed into the ocean. So believe it. Just breaking off. He can do it. We don't come to just sing songs, hear a sermon, go home. No. But when the presence of God is here, He can move miracles. He can do anything. And I choose right now to set myself in the position of His heart. And I turn this rudder in the direction of His kingdom and of His promises. And I'm not looking back. So Jesus... We call upon your matchless name. The name above all names. That at the mention of your name, every knee must bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. We lift up the name that is I am. You are everything. There are not enough adjectives to describe how beautiful and big and gracious and wondrous and all powerful you are. And so we call out to you right now, not in our own strength, but by the power of the Lord, we declare your promises over ailments that be broken off in the name of Jesus. Over fear be broken off in the name of Jesus. Over pains, broken off in the name of Jesus. Mental imprisonment, broken off in the name of Jesus. Addiction, broken off in the name of Jesus. Generational curses that have been spoken over you that you'll never, ever escape from because it's been spoken over you too much. I call that broken off in the name of Jesus. And Lord, right now, we declare your promise over every dead situation. We declare your promise is yes and amen. There is no no when it comes to your promises, but yes and amen. Let it be. Can we just put our hands together and thank God, believing what we prayed, we received it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You guys can bring the communion forward. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. And as you're receiving communion, I want I want you to look at this as the, the seal to the thing the things that you just prayed. I want you to look at this as, as the, the done, the, the, the stamp of approval. Right? You know, back in the day, I cannot remember this movie to save my life. It wasn't The Goonies. It was like Little Rascals or something like that. But, but they had this like, like rule list as a group. And they're like, hey, any rules that we have on this, this is our code. You can't break this. This is forever. And what they did, they cut their finger and they took that blood and they they, they etched their name. They etched their name on there. Why? As a commitment to the code. 
And in the same way, Jesus, through His blood, signed over your life. Randy, Jesus, you're covered. Sign it over your life. You're covered. Jesus. And as you take this, I just want you to see yourself the way that God does. His Son. And every time we do this, we know that there's two parts to this communion. Specifically so. This body that was battered and so mutilated it said that they didn't even recognize Him as Jesus. It was that bad that they ripped His flesh to shreds. And it said that He was broken so that you could be made whole. And then this blood that represents the forgiveness of your sin. It represents the forgiveness of everything in your life that kept you from God it was Jesus' blood that signed His name to say, come on home. And so as you take this, whatever you need, believe that you have received it through this, through this act of faith. You may go ahead and take the elements.